Okay, so last time we started talking about poor elasticity, and we went through this sort of long derivation of BO's coefficient, uh, which is sort of a correction to the effective stress model. Uh, so then we're going to talk about some other properties of poor elasticity today. And one of those is that uh, when we talk about poor elasticity, we're, we're automatically implying viscoelasticity. Right? So who knows what the word sort of in an engineering or science context, what the word visco means. Hmm? It has something to do with time, right? So anytime you see anytime you see visco in front of anything, right? Like viscosity even. Uh, but when you see viscoelasticity, viscoplasticity, any any visco anything, it's implying some type of time dependence, right? So in this case, we're talking about the primarily the time dependence of loading, right? So the material's response is going to be dependent upon how fast you load it, right? So on the right-hand side over here, you see a family of stress-strain curves that increase with strain rate. So as I load the material faster, if I load the material faster, the material behaves stronger and stronger, right? And we're talking about, in a poor elastic setting, this, is, this has to do with the fact that our material has fluid in it, and that fluid can diffuse depending on the permeability of the material and the viscosity of the fluid and other things, right? The fluid can diffuse at different rates, right? So if you go back to my sort of sponge example, right? If we have a wet sponge and it's filled with water and, and I sort of squeeze it fast, uh, there's, there's, you know, it's, it's all going to squeeze out, like sort of, no matter how fast I squeeze it. But if you put a very, very viscous fluid in there and then I squeeze it out, well, in the, in the sort of time it takes me to squeeze the sponge, that fluid may not have time to leave the pore space and therefore, when I squeeze the sponge, it's going to feel much stiffer. Right? And the material response is dependent upon the fluid inside, and the fluid inside is de dependent upon time. Right? Its diffusion is dependent on time. Right? And so another thing that this brings up is, so over here on the right, we have the stress-strain plot and a family of stress-strain curves with increasing strain rate. Well, what are the units of strain rate? One over time, right? Because strain is unitless and per time, right? Strain rate. So you have one over, one over second. So what's another common unit that has, you know, also has units of one over second? What is a name for it? Somebody said it, huh? Yeah, fr frequency, right? But there's an actual word like I'm looking for for the unit. Hertz, right? Yeah. So hertz is the unit. Uh, and, and typically, when we're talking about hertz, we're talking about frequency, the frequency of loading. Right? And the reason this is important, so obviously, you know, that if it's strain rate dependent, then it's also, you know, by that sort of argument, it's also frequency dependent. And the reason that's important is because of how we test materials in the field is typically with sonic logs, right, with sonic vibrations. So we, we vibrate the material with sound, and we listen for reflections. And it turns out, and then we can, you know, infer what's what the material properties are for that. Well, it turns out because um, we have this frequency dependence, we have to understand that when we interpret the data, as a how, uh, you know, how what we're measuring is actually frequency dependent, uh, and that you know if we don't take that into account, we could. You know, get wrong modulus values or, or you know, misunderstood modulus values, you know, material property values for the strength of the rock. And remember, the, the whole reason we're doing any of this and trying to understand any of it is because ultimately we want to take these material properties and put them into physical models and make predictions, predictions about the strength of the rock and other things so that we can know when the rock will fail and, you know, lead to unstable well bores or other examples.
So when we're talking about viscoelastic, or you know, poroelastic materials, we have to understand that they're also viscoelastic materials. There's a time dependence, frequency dependence. And that shows up here. So this is a plot of pressure, right? So when we talk about pressure, we're basically talking about hydrostatic pressure. Okay. Hydrostatic pressure versus volumetric <laughs> strain. So what is the slope of this? What material property is the slope of that? Well, Young's modulus would be axial stress versus axial strain. Pressure or hydrostatic stress versus volumetric strain. There's a different word for that. Bulk modulus. Right, bulk modulus. Okay. So in this plot, the solid lines, uh, the, well, let me switch the, um, the ones labeled static, let's say. The ones labeled static in the legend, which are, let's see. What happened to my, what happened to my uh, pen? So we're talking about this, this line here. So that was done, well, both of the measurements were in fact done in the laboratory, okay? So this is a standard uh, hydrostatic compression test. So you know, so you're basically squeezing on all sides of the sample, and then measuring the volumetric strain. Okay, and so that the the red line that I traced in, in all cases is a plot of you know the direct measurements, right? So the direct measurement of pressure that you're applying to some measure of volumetric strain, which I don't exactly know how it's done in this test, but it can be done with strain gauges directly on the sample. Uh, it can be done uh, optically with laser interferometer. It can be there's several ways uh, that you can measure the, the volumetric strain. You can also just uh, sort of compute the vo the volume, right? You, you can s measure the volume of the sample and with respect to its reference volume. So anyway, so though this sort of red lines that I traced were done in a way that you're d it's a direct measurement, right? And those are the modulus values you get. Now, what you also see is you have load unload cycles. So this is loading, and you, this is an unload. Okay. So in the loading, you see this sort of stiffening effect, and that is the viscoelastic response because you know as you're 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 squeezing it, and the fluid is trying to diffuse away. And so you know the the, the more you load it, and the faster time you squeeze it, well then you know the material gets stiffer and stiffer because the fluid's not sort of moving out of the way fast enough. In these unload cycles that you see right here, so in these unload cycles, uh, now in that case, that's a that's a representative uh, measure of the bulk modulus of the solid skeleton because now you've unloaded the sample, and the pore pressure is at that time is you know sort of in equilibrium, and so this is the this is the actual bulk modulus for the solid skeleton that would go into that BO coefficient. Uh, so that's in this unload cycle. So these tests are done very, very slowly. Uh, I mean, you guys know when you use your test frame in your lab, right, this, this, to watch the test happen is kind of like watching paint dry, right? It's very, very slow loading. And so these tests are carried out over 20 or 30 minutes, maybe, very slow. So like, you know, if you sat there and just watched it with your eye, you wouldn't even see the thing being loaded. It's loaded so slowly. However, uh, these other lines, which I'll draw in a different color, or trace over in a different color. Were measured with some type of sonic log. Right? So they were, even those who were done in the laboratory, they were measured in a way that you would measure the modulus in the field. And so, uh, so that you can see that I mean the slope of this blue line is quite different than the slope of that red line. 
and that's because you're probing the material response at a different frequency. Now, what you will, will notice is the, the slope of the blue line is pretty close to the unloading slope in all cases. Right? Particularly here, you can see in the unloading, right? they're, they're almost the same. In the unloading case, the slope of this is, is equivalent to the other slope. Right? And so when you're, when you're measuring the sort of with the ultrasonics, what you're, what you're measuring is effectively the, the solid skeleton, right? because you're, you're probing it at a frequency that doesn't, doesn't give the, that where the pore pressure is sort of in equilibrium. Okay? So it's just under, understand, I mean, this, this experiment was done in the lab with two different measurement techniques. The sort of standard in the lab way, directly measuring the bulk, the, the pressure and the volumetric uh, strain, and then also using um, ultrasonics or sonic, sonic logs, which is what you would do in the field. So, you know, again, even even on the sonic scale, what's up? So you can you can watch when you apply the actual test for the uh, and and then you plot the compression. The it gives you still readings of, of the of the strain, but it was not it didn't like stop strain right away. Is that what you mean by uh, related to stress and stuff? Uh, that could also it could, it, it's probably more likely to a stress relaxation effect. Or creep, and we're gonna talk about that in just a second. So, uh, you know, just this is just another plot that says, you know, even even on the scale of, you know, sonics to ultrasonics, like so, sonics are like frequencies of kilo kilohertz, which is what we use in the field, uh, whereas ultrasonics are megahertz, and so even on even on this scale. You can see a, a difference. So these are basically your, your your two velocity measurements, your P wave and your S wave, versus frequency. And so you know even from uh, from the ultrasonic scale to the to the well from the sonic to the ultrasonic, then there's a difference in the uh, in the material response for poor elastic rocks. So it's just another example of that. And so this is. Uh, uh, you know, Zobeck calls squirt theory or SQRT theory. I, I don't know that I've ever heard that anywhere else in mechanics literature. Uh, but it, if you wanted to read more about this in, in the book, the, it's under the section titles, the squirt theory. Um, and, you know, the theory basically is the sort of equations that describe the transition from the drained to the undrained limit uh, for the poor elastic equation, for poor elasticity theory. So we're not going to talk about that. I don't think that the equations themselves are that useful or necessary. Um, but I think the, the description of drained and undrained is pretty common in mechanics literature. And the response of the materials at, at the either end of those two limits, I think it's intuitive enough that we should talk about it. Okay. So we'll start, uh, even though I, uh, I'll talk about them in the opposite order that they're listed there. So in the, in the undrained limit, right? The, in the undrained limit, this is, uh, you know, so if you were to solve the actual equations of poor elasticity, there are a couple equations, uh, mechanics, right, the conservation of momentum equation with the effect of stress, which has pressure in it, and then there's also a, a pressure diffusion equation, a diffusivity equation, right? And so th those equations are coupled to one another. When the undrained limit, this is the limit in which the pore pressure affects the mechanical response, but the mechanical response does not affect the pore pressure. Okay? And so the idea here, this is, this is going back to my sponge example. This is my sponge when I have an impermeable membrane around it, the outside. Right? So the pressure, you know, whatever pore pressure the fluid is in there is, uh, you know, if I, if I squeeze the sponge, no fluid is going to diffuse out of it. And so this, the, 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 the pore pressure uh, is going to have an effect on the mechanical response. It's going to be hard to squeeze that sponge, right? Because the, you know, I'm going to have to compress the fluid in it to, to, to squeeze it, right? So uh, you know, in, in, uh, obviously, if you have very impermeable media, like shales, 
Okay, this is, this is a close to the undrained limit okay, because the fluid doesn't diffuse. You know, diffusion is a very slow process, right? And keep in mind, diffusion is the process that governs like heat conduction. So uh, it's very slow. Like you know, if we came into this room and it was 40 degrees and all we had was like an old radiator heater, you know, like. So it's, it's a little different than we have central air because it's blown in, so you have a convective diffusion process. But like if all I had was a, a radiator heater, like you see in old buildings, over there in the corner of the room, and we walked in here and it was 40 degrees and I turned it on, you know, it would take several hours to get the room up to 72 degrees, right? Because that's, that process is diffusion, so it's a very slow process. Right? So that, you know, uh, Fluid flow in a, in, a porous, in a porous media is that same process, it's very slow, right? So in, a, in something like a shale that's very low permeability, the rates at which we load it in drilling and hydraulic fracturing and other things tend to um, happen at a rate that's faster than the, f than the fluid diffuses away, right? And so this is very close to the undrained limit. So then the opposite of that is the drain limit. And this is in a very, very highly permeable media where the fluid diffusion, so now this is back to my, squ my, my sponge, um, you know, my very, very porous sponge that, you know, when I, when I squeeze it with very little resistance, the fluid will diffuse out of it. So that, that's the drain limit. Right? And so, you know, again, the physical setting Slow loading on very permeable media, right? So if I squeeze my punch sponge very slowly, then the the fluid uh, will diffuse out of it sort of without with very little resistance, very fast, right? You know, it won't. I won't, the the mechanical the response of the sponge itself in terms of like you know how much force it takes to compress the sponge. If I do it very very slowly and the sponge is very permeable, it, it'll it won't change very much due to the fact that the fluid is there. So it's just gonna diffuse out relatively quick. So those are the two sort of scenarios, the drained and the undrained limit, okay? Again, uh, yeah, I think that's all I need to say.